Diane's been is a mid has been a midwife in the UK for the past 14 years. She has been working with the NHS. Aside from being a midwife, she's interested in creating awareness about autism, and which is not surprising. She's going to tell us how she's going to do that and how the, the promoting of autism awareness in midwifery practice is very, very important. She's going to take us through that. Aside from that, Diane Baines is interested in hypnobatting, which is a form of helping to allay fear and anxiety in the mother in an attempt to promote her physical and emotional well-being. She's also a hypnotherapist, which is a form of alternative medicine by using, hyp using hypnosis. And then she's also interested in Reiki, which is a form of energy healing. Welcome, Diane Baines, to the Virtual International Day of the Midwife. I'm going to give you the rights. Right That's to great. Me. Thanks, Salima. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the presentation. Thank you for tuning in. So I'm going to talk a little bit about promoting autism awareness in midwifery practice. I'm just going to give you an overview of autism. I know some of you will be aware of it and some of you won't. Some of you will have experience of it and some of you won't. I'm just going to give you an overview of the things that I think is quite important for you to know as a practitioner, as a midwife, and give you an idea of some of the techniques that you can use to help support your women that um, you, you'll see you're having babies and also helping them on their initial journey into motherhood as well. So the topics that I'm going to cover are an overview of autism presentation, specifically in girls and women. Also, I'll cover a lack of diagnosis and what this can result in, which is the manifestation of subsequent mental health issues in women. Um, and then I'll go on to the impact of the lack of support um, that this has on women's ability to build relationships and to understand what the relationships are and how this affects the family planning choices that they make, which is obviously where we come in and give support. I'll discuss an overview of masking techniques that are used by women to try um, and cope in day-to-day -day living and how this manifests and how as health practitioners that we can um, spot these issues. And then I'll discuss about how to support and advocate for these women throughout the journey of childbirth. And then also um, how we can raise awareness of autism in our own workplaces and in our own community. And also for some of us among our own families as well, once we have the extra knowledge. So, I just want to give you a really easy visual that um, when I'm talking about autism, um, we now understand that there are a whole, um, a whole spectrum of learning issues that affect um, lots of people all over the world. And some countries have words for all of these issues and some countries do not. Um, so some countries um, might have things like attention deficit disorder, autism, um, whereas some countries might just see individuals as not quite fitting in um, to the expected norms of behaviour, um, usually from childhood. Um, so we're looking at um, Leo Kanner in 1943. He looked at children and basically he started to see that there were um, issues within children that really didn't fit the model of mental health diagnosis such as schizophrenia and bipolar etc and his further research um, led to his name being given to that research and then from there um, these children were able to access support and then research grew from there um, so that's nearly 80 years ago and we're still now developing our research within the spectrum of autism and within the spectrum of learning issues. So if you're in a country that recognises autism, great. How is your country responding to it? 
more importantly, how is your midwifery service responding to it and recognising it? Um, if you're in a country that doesn't even know the word autism yet, then um, once you've got an awareness of some of the issues that can be apparent, then um, you might be the first person that says, actually, this person might have autism. How can we support that within our midwifery context? So I just want to draw your attention to the statistics that by the age of seven, which to be fair, some children will have autism, it's very obvious, such as non-communication, not meeting milestones, um, depending how your country um, looks at child health. Um, and usually by the age of seven, our ratio of diagnosis from boys to girls is one to four. So for every one girl, you'll have four boys in a classroom, for example, that have been diagnosed. So the importance of that is to recognise that only one girl has that support in place, whereas the four boys, they have all that support in place all through their schooling and then through to their adult life, that recognition. So there'll be three girls, as you can see by the statistics, by the age of 40, the ratio is shown to be more even. So we thought traditionally that autism was more of a boy issue, but actually the research that's coming out, especially in the last few years, is suggesting that actually girls have autism too, as much as boys, but girls are better at covering up. Um, and boys just can't cope given an environment such as school, where there are so many expected social norms, then it's as physical aggression. And that's what's dealt with rather than the underlying issue. So there'll be girls that we come across as childbearing mothers who might have some of the characteristics of autism that I'm going to discuss with you, but have never had a formal diagnosis, never had any support in place, and might not even recognise themselves that they have autism, or that's why they've maybe struggled in some situations throughout their life. Um, and there is a big thing now in the UK, more and more women in their 40s are actually getting diagnosed with autism um, and because of this growing awareness. So it's just something to bear in mind that when you're interacting with ladies, they might have autism, but they've never had an official diagnosis. Um, so I'm going to go to a word that is New Zealand um, in origin and it's from the Maori language and I know there's a couple of out there from New Zealand so I um, apologise for my pronunciation but I'm going to say Taki Wantanga um, and this is great. This word, if you don't remember anything else from the presentation, take this word away with you. Um, so in New Zealand um, they have the luxury of not yet, in have, not yet having words for certain um, issues and autism was one of them. So the guy that was put in charge of developing the new words for autism in the Maori language um, was fantastic and he did a little news piece and he said when he observed people with autism he recognised that they had their own timing, their own spacing their own pacing and their own life rhythm. And so he came up with the word takiwantanga, which means in your own space and time. And that really does epitomise what autism is. Basically, you've got an individual that has got their own way of doing things, their own timing, their own understanding, and they find themselves especially here in the UK, having to constantly fit into social norms that cause them a lot of distress. And then what happens is their, their mind kind of wants to shut down and then is not able to process or not able to interact with the world around them. So in their own time and space is a really, really good definition of autism. <clears throat> and then this particular official went on to say that um, he specifically chose words that um, put a positive spin on autism. So he was focusing on the ability rather than disability to ensure that the terms are non-judgmental. And I thought this was fantastic because here in the UK, we talk about disability and we talk about all the learning issues that um, 
people have as disabilities, whereas truthfully, it really should be seen as just another way of looking at the world <coughs> and increasing our tolerance. Um, so not everybody fits into a way that we think we should be. And we are having lots of tolerance with other issues such as gender um, in the world. So why shouldn't we have this tolerance with uh, learning issues as well? So this is a really good um, graphic which talks about autism spectrum. So autism has um, lots of different kind of nuances and definitions within that one title of autism. Uh, you might have heard of autism spectrum disorder, ASD. Um, this has come about because we used to think that autism was linear. So you'd have, say, a starting point here, if you can see with the cursor, where you'd have someone that was um, non-conversant, kind of mute, and then all the way up here, you'd have someone that was able to socially interact and only had what appeared as some um, superficial issues. But that's kind of been put by the wayside now and we talk about the autism spectrum. So people can have um, some speech issues, for example, but be highly intelligent, whereas I used to think someone who can't speak didn't have the intelligence there as well. Um, and depending what country you're from, then your um, national psychology will still think about things in a, diff a different way along that, um, along that spectrum. So we have our classic autism, which is Canners, who's already mentioned Leo Canner, who first came about with let's observe children uh, rather than just giving them um, um, psychological labels such as schizophrenia, um, let's actually observe their behaviour, then came about with actually they have not got mental um, incapacity, it's actually a learning issue or an environmental issue. And I would say the best way to think about that is with someone with autism, you, they are a square peg and you're trying to make them fit into society. So trying to make them kind of fit into a round hole. And you wouldn't do that normally, but we seem to kind of want to do that with our children sometimes, especially in the UK, and especially within our current um, education system. We want to um, try and get all children to uh, perform the same and be the same in the way that they have that aptitude. But that's not always the case um, and that's not necessarily the best thing either for their mental health. Um, and then we also have Asperger's syndrome, which you will sometimes hear referred to as high functioning autism. Um, so in that category, You'll have people um, that may have average or above average intelligence and are able to interact socially to some extent, but actually underneath they're trying to um, go through the issues that they've occurred during the day and make sense of them. And they might appear that they, um, on the outside, that they're coping well in a social situation, but actually all the feelings they're having can be quite overwhelming. And then you've got pathological demand avoidance, which um, you might have heard of, or you might not have heard of at all. Path pathological demand avoidance is considered um, a form of autism where an individual will be motivated by anxiety mostly, and they will like to have control around them. So any kind of, um, demand um, can interfere with their sense of self and this can manifest as outbursts or meltdowns um, and this is one that might be really really um, pertinent to midwifery because you might have a woman that you're looking after and you think oh she's not really interacting or she's being really um, obtuse or she's being really argumentative to everything I'm discussing especially in labour when they feel very vulnerable um, and you could actually ask yourself, oh, has she got this pathological demand avoidance? Is every command being met with negotiation? And then, oh, actually, um, I think she might have that. Let's um, approach this in a different way. 
Um, and once you've got the heightened understanding of these issues when you're looking after your women, it can really improve the holistic way that you care for women. So classic autism, um, you can have levels of severity with that. So what kind of things are we looking at? We're looking at things like um, ability to interact socially, social communication impairment, imagination impairment, and repetitive activities. So um, you could have someone that's quite aloof and indifferent. So from a midwifery perspective, your patient isn't engaging with you, they can't maintain eye contact, it feels like they're not really listening to anything you're saying. But these are um, issues that are apparent because the social interaction to them is really overwhelming. If you're looking at um, someone who has autism in the face and you're asking them directly, that can be so overwhelming that their capacity to deal with the situation is just, they're going to shut down mode. Um, and then you can have people that are able to socialise in groups, um, but they need some form of support within that as well. And then you have um, social communication impairment. So you can have a variety where people can't communicate at all, um, or they might have selective mutism to people that are really um, talk a lot and they don't have kind of the social cues that actually their companions might not be listening to them or actually it's now time for someone else to have a little um, talk in the conversation. And then also you can have imagination issues where they might have limited play, they might have isolated play, prefer to play on their own, um, they might have um, certain objects that they like to play with, we call them here in the UK fidget toys and stim simulators like something with a click, something like it's got a click on it, uh, fidget spinners and children will sit and play with those. It's quite commonplace now in the UK in school settings for children to have these um, and it helps them main maintain control really through that social situation. And then repetitive activities, um, you might have someone that has repetitive um, issues, they might do rocking issues and that's a self-soothing self issue. And then you might have people um, that have particular interests, um, things in particular that they know about, um, maybe for boys it might be something like trains, that they're obsessed with trains. Um, so. Um, Going back to autism spectrum and the ASD that we refer to, so this is a really helpful graphic. So you're looking at people, they could be anywhere on here, just like anyone that um, doesn't have autism or is neurotypical as we say, they could be anywhere on here. So you could have someone that's totally mute, doesn't speak at all, but actually they're really intelligent and their executive function is really high. You could have someone with sensory issues, who doesn't like loud sounds, um, but their perception of what's happening around them is really quite high. So this is a really good um, visual. And then going further through to Asperger's, high functioning autism, as we've discussed already, um, you, someone with above average intelligence, they have less speech issues, they have language processing, um, they do have a heightened sense of anxiety, they can be overwhelmed. And often this can be misdiagnosed from a mental health point of view as depression, anxiety, especially in young young girls. Um, but it's not, it's an under, underlying, underlying issue of autism rather than the mental health issues. And here in the UK, um, it does seem to be more of a focus on the mental health side rather than, um, oh, actually, this child might have autism, let's support them with that. Um, they can find everyday interactions really hard. They can find building rapport in a social situation quite overwhelming. And there might be a lack of awareness of cues within a social situation as well. Um, and then most uh, importantly for us to be aware of as life is that they have sensitivity to sounds, taste, textures, smells, touch and light. So maybe for a neurotypical person, they can be in a room um, and for someone with autism, they could be in a room, they could hear maybe lots of noises going on, 
they're hypersensitive to noise, it can be overwhelming for them. If they then have to like sit and eat in that situation and the food and the texture of what they're eating they don't like, and then again that can be overwhelming for them. It's a sensory issue rather than a like issue. And then also they might be um, find a smell, somebody else's dinner, if they're sat at the dinner table, quite overwhelming. All these things are overstimulation of the senses. Um, and so it can lead to like what we would call maybe a meltdown. Um, and we also refer to that as the Coke bottle effect. So if a child, for example, has been at school all day, they've been trying to fit into a situation, they can't articulate, they haven't got the words. Um, to explain their um, inner feelings, then they'll come home with a parent, typically they'll explode like a Coke bottle. Because so once they get home, they feel safe in their home environment. Um, and then again, as we discussed, the pathological demand avoidance. So this will be someone typically who resists ordinary demands of life, so not uncommon for them not to like to brush their hair or clean their teeth or even be active in self-care of washing themselves. Um, they'll use distraction, excuses, renegotiation um, to get through any heightened anxiety issues. Um, they may appear sociable, but they lack the understanding and they ha can have excessive mood swings and impulsivity um, and their behaviour can be focused on other people. This is one in particular that I think as midwives we might see in our women um, and we think, oh, you know, they've got a psychological issue. But actually it might be that they've got pathological demand avoidance, they've got autism, but they've never had a diagnosis to work with. What can we do to help these women? So strategies for PDA and for autism, um, what can we do? In our society, especially in the UK, um, we expect people to conform to social norms um, throughout school, throughout education and within the workplace. Um, what we need to do with autism, children with autism, is give them that um, taku mantanga, that give them their own time, give them their own space. Don't expect them, don't overload them with demands. So this is what we can do with our women with autism, especially through um, their um, labour and also in the antenatal period as well. Be flexible with them, um, build relationships with them, give them the extra time. Um, is it really overwhelming for them being in a waiting room? So by the time they come to see you, they're so overloaded. They don't have any ability to articulate any of the questions that they have. Um, or during your routine antenatal clinic appointments. Could you be flexible? Could you see them at home? Could you see them at the beginning of clinic to take away that stress for them? Even having that conversation with them will help them think, oh, this person understands some of the things that I'm going through and already initiates that um, relationship on a much higher level than you would normally. Offer the individual choices. Um, do they want to um, have one particular midwife, can, can you offer them continuity of care in your current role, in your current model that you have where you work. Um, also choose your words carefully, so people with autism might think very literally, so if you have a conversation about something, um, they will not appreciate kind of subtle nuances or um, kind of subtle jokes you have to be very literal and and you have to have that understanding relayed back to you that they have understood what you have talked about um, use humor if you can try and always remain calm it, it might be you think oh they're not listening they're not doing as i've asked them especially in that labor environment um, you might think oh they're not behaving as i want them to behave or as they should behave, then try and remain as calm as you can. Um, and that will, in itself, just give them that extra time, that extra space, and that will allow them to think this person is, is with me, and it allows them, their brain just to calm down and then react um, more progressively. 
and try and reduce any direct demands. And this is something that is you have to really think about. So if you're talking to somebody, say, and um, and you want them to in labour assume different positions or do something, you just say you have to kind of say. Would it be possible for you to go to the toilet now? Would it be possible for me to um, do an examination? Um, try and avoid any direct commands, because um, then they might initially be, be um, met with resistance. So again, as we've discussed, specifically in girls, we're looking at what we're calling here in the UK now a hidden gender. These girls, unfortunately, have, have not been diagnosed, have not got the support that they needed at school, and then they've gone out into the world and in, into adolescence. They're not too secure about making their relationships, um, and it makes them especially vulnerable, and, and then they come to see us as young women pregnant, um, and sometimes in quite vulnerable relationships. Um, so what are we looking for in girls? in school setting and within the midwifery. So we're calling them, say, the hidden gender. Um, so the presentation in boys, um, maybe they'll have obsessions, things like that, be quite obvious. Whereas in girls, not so obvious. They might have an obsession with the latest pop band, um, but they're able to fit that in with the social norms. So it becomes, you'll often hear teachers say, oh, they fit really well in class. Um, as a parent raises, raises an issue, you know, is autism an issue with my child? Teachers will say, oh, they're fit in class, they're really helpful, um, but they're actually um, seen on their own. It looks as though they're around people and they've got all that friendship group, but actually they'll be on the periphery of the friendship group and the teacher in a class of 30 children is not actually able to see that fully. Um, and then obviously by the age of seven or eight, as children trans, trans um, as children go into the um, pre-puberty, basically, then these issues become more of, more obvious. So we talk about girls having masking techniques, so uh, following peer trends and that urge to fit in, and um, they'll copy behaviours and they lose a sense of their true self. Um, and basically that can leave them feeling exhausted and overwhelmed. And these things are all the same if you're looking at a mother in pregnancy. She, she is acting like she thinks she should act. She thinks that she should be happy about being pregnant. She thinks she, she should be bonding with her child. So these kind of things um, are sometimes a little bit of a struggle with, for women with autism. So symptoms of autism, I love this graphic. Let's talk about all the positives. So someone with autism never gives up. They're a loyal friend, trustworthy and dependable. They're a true seeker who wants to do what is right. They're caring, emphatic, sensitive and creative. Their ability to hyper-focus and analyze and systemize. And they love details, they notice patterns others may miss. They perceive the world in a unique way. They're passionate about ideas and solving problems, and they have an amazing long-term memory, and they can share that information. So, used in the right way, we have two really um, strong exponents, Greta Thunberg, who's had a lot of coverage this year, and she's been a fantastic role model for girls with um, autism Asperger's, and she's been very open that she has Asperger's, um, and um, that makes her who she is. And she um, epitomises really that she sees the world in a different way. She works to raise awareness of climate change and she's made such a massive difference to everybody. And she epitomises what autistic people see is that they see a, a truth, um, an underlying truth that other people can't always see. And Temple Grandin, some of you may have heard of, she's um, a big exponent of autism in the US. Um, this book's a really good book, it's a really good starting point for anybody that's interested. It is available on Audible, really accessible, and it talks about um, her childhood, growing up with autism, and actually how she's been able to uh, become very successful um, with those traits in the workplace as well. So we'll revisit our one to every four boys you, diagnosed, and we are looking at our... Um, 
looking at our girls that do not get diagnosed, how can we support them in midwifery? So a lack of diagnosis might lead to subsequent mental health issues. And so these manif might manifest all the way through childhood and adolescence. So when these girls come to us, they might have inability to recognize someone's ulterior motive in a relationship. So it makes them uh, more vulnerable to risk of abuse and exploitation. We might see girls that have had substance misuse, drugs and alcohol, and they're not making very good relationship choices and not making good family planning choices because they haven't had that extra social education about um, making good relationships and, and also making choices about their um, health and, and their um, reproductive health as well. Uh, just a practice point right at the end and then we're, we're finished with the presentation is that um, just imagine you've got um, um, a lady called Jill, she comes into hospital to deliver her first baby and she has autism. She likes her routine and gets very anxious in new places and around new people she's never met. Her midwife, Helen, came into the room, forgot to introduce herself, she switched on all the lights which and uh, she told Jill she was too busy to look at her birth plan and would just do what was needed to get the job done. Jill, um, she told Jill she needed to move things along, otherwise her baby might be very poorly or die as her blood pressure was too high. Now, we all know there are lots of issues with that kind of midwifery care, but um, it can happen. So how would this make Jill feel? She's feeling overwhelmed, overstimulated, out of control. She's got no safe place. She's feeling very anxious, very scared and confused and quite rightly so. But she'll be feeling this to an extortionate extent where her whole senses are overwhelmed. Um, and for Jill, this might manifest as really extreme reaction to the situation. Um, and it will have poor outcomes for her and her baby. Uh, what could the midwife have done differently? Well, what can we be doing for these women? What extra care can we be putting in place in our birthing units? Um, introducing ourselves, offering tours of the room or the unit prior to admission, so that can alleviate any anxieties and fears where the women know where they're going to go. We can offer them a pre-birth plan, going through that with the midwife or a midwife that might be looking after them in labour. But having awareness of um, the effect of light, sound, smells, voice, tone and touch and any demands through that whole interaction of labour. Outlining a clear plan of care uh, with the patient before they come into hospital. Um, having no direct requests or demands. And um, thinking that autistic women can think literally. So being told that your baby might die, she actually might think that her baby might die. Um, and that's not something that anybody wants to um, hear or keep repeating, um, you know, as they go through that um, journey of motherhood. And here in the UK, we have lanyards with um, um, sunflowers on for autism awareness. They started using them in Heathrow in the airport, um, showing people that needed just a little bit of extra support going through the process through the airport. So could we introduce something like that into our healthcare systems here? So we have a lanyard or a wristband that shows all healthcare staff that people need extra support with what's happening to them. Um, also in the UK, we, there, we have a healthcare passport as well, which is brought about by the National Autistic Society. Um, and that gives an outline of what um, each person needs extra to help their, um, help their journey through the healthcare. Um, I would advocate you all to watch um, this lovely short film by Disney called Float. It's a very short film, about six minutes, and it's done by this guy, Bobby Raburio, based on his own relationship with his son with autism. And if you watch that film, you'll have a little bit of an idea about what autism can do for a child and how it affects the parent and the relationship as well. Um, and I've put that on my uh, Facebook page as well, if you want a quick link to that. And then the resources here in the UK, National Autistic Society, Temple Grandin Books, and the Autism Toolbox, um, which is a website from Scottish, the Scottish NHS, 
um, and some really good um, talks on um, TED Talks on autism and Sarah Hendricks is somebody that I would um, look for on YouTube as well. Um, and then I'd just like to say thank you very much for your time. It's been a very quick overview there. If you need to know any more information, just contact me on Facebook uh, or email me. Not a problem at all. And um, I think Halima's there. I'll hand back over to Halima if you're there. Hi, Halima. Hi there. Yeah, thank you very much for that presentation. Yeah. We would like to take questions from the audience. Do we have very short time for us to take this question? We have just five minutes for us to end this session. Then we'll go to the next two rooms where another presentation is coming up. So then, are you happy to take questions now? Yes, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, if before the question comes in, if I may ask, can you you mentioned something about the NHS health passport? Can you tell me more about the NHS health passport and how it is used to support people with extra need, please? Yeah, um, it's the National Autistic Society that have developed it, which is a charity here in the UK. Um, and basically, it's um, a little uh, page document and it gives um, an insight to the individual that's been treated for the um, in healthcare. Um, um, there was um, a young lad who had autism, had underlying um, health issues, and unfortunately, because the staff weren't really aware of his autism and how that manifested for him or how they could support that, um, he actually died. And his mum has been a really good advocate about bringing forward this issue and um, has lobbied the UK government. And as a result of that, uh, the UK government this year have, um, announced that all healthcare professionals, it's um, compulsory for them to have autism training and for all healthcare students coming through and midwifery students that it is in compulsory for them to have training on autism in their in their studies and the healthcare passport um, is a four pages document and it just gives a simple overview of what the issues are for this particular individual and how healthcare staff can support them and what they like and don't like um, and also um, that is being transferred over to the education setting now as well um, and it takes away a lot of that um, where family or parents will have to advocate on a child's behalf it will all be written and put in the medical notes and it can be used by medical staff um, and some people are aware of it in the UK and some people aren't and more people um, need to be using it more to support um, our, our, um, our children and our women in midwifery. That's quite a good arrangement. Thank you very much, Diane. I want to ask one very important thing before we go. Um, what three things do you think a midwife should be aware of when supporting a child with a special, a, a woman with autism and labor, please? They need to be aware that, um, like we are with every woman, that they are the individual who needs to treat them as such. Um, but with women with autism, they might not be able to always articulate everything that they need. So really, I would specifically say, let's show these women the room where they're going to be delivering their babies. Let's talk about home birth options as well. Um, let's think about um, interaction. How do they need the lights? How, how do they need everything in the room? Ask them, what do you need us to do for you? How can we facilitate your birth? And also have the um, kindness and understanding that they might not react to things as you expect them to. And their underlying um, emotion might be anxiety driven and how you can support that as well. I want to say thank you very much, Diane, for this amazing presentation. Thank you, Helena.